Hello and welcome back to my channel and um, Socks is here this afternoon on the arm of my chair. He's a bit sickly this last couple of days. I don't know what the problem is. His appetite's not what it usually is. He's usually a really, really hungry cat. Hello to everyone Socks. Still purring aren't you? You're so happy. <laughs> we'll put you down there. You sit on your cushion. I thought today I would talk about some picture books. That's my idea. Um, so I've grabbed some things off the shelves. Here's one of my all-time favourites. You can still see the, the cardboard boxes of drawings back there. That looks terrible. It doesn't matter. Rotten Island by William Steig, who was the man who did um, the original book that... Shrek came from. This is his storybook about an evil island of dreadful monsters. There was once a very unbeautiful, very rocky, rotten island. It had acres of sharp gravel and volcanoes that belched fire and smoke, spewed hot lava and spat poison arrows and double-headed toads. Everything is awful. <laughs> on uh, Rotten Island. And there's a war, a war between the monsters. I wish I'd seen this and known about this as a kid. It's only in recent years that I've discovered it. Even when they freeze at night, the monsters are still fighting. Yes, that's right, they freeze overnight. The sun burned hotter than ever, and when freezing night came with its wild winds, the battle was frozen solid until morning when it thawed out and started all over again. It's just wonderful. And the best thing about William Steig is that there's something about his artwork that makes you want to draw, which is the best thing ever for picture books, which is why all the overly finished and polished computer stuff that's done in kids' books at the moment, not all of them, but a lot of them, is too slick and it would um, put it wouldn't make you want to do your own. And I think the best picture books made the reader, whether they're children or adults, it made them want to draw and write stories of their own. Here's a recent one. I think Rotten Island is from the 60s or 70s. This is very recent. Gustavo the Shy Ghost by Flavia Z. Drago, or Z. Drago, a Halloween book. Beautifully done. I don't know if this is digital or if it's crayons. I think it's probably done digitally, but it's made to look as if it's, I don't know, oil pastels and tissue paper and crepe paper and spattered paint. This is about a shy ghost who plays violin and holds a concert, hoping to make friends, and he thinks nobody has, has come along. It's a really, really lovely book, and one that, um, look, there he is, blushing. One that I've returned to <coughs> um, and read with great pleasure. Yep, there he is with all of his pals, pumpkin-headed boy at the bottom, and various skull-faced creatures <laughs> and cat people, and all his Halloween pals. It's a lovely book. Here's one from, I think, the 80s or 90s. Quentin Blake, a perennial favourite, early 90s. Professor Dupont had 10 cockatoos. He was very proud of them, his cockatoos. Now, they adapted one of Quentin Blake's cartoons for Christmas a couple of years ago, and I thought got it kind of wrong. Again, they made it too slick, when, of course, his drawings are scratchy and... Um, of the moment and again they feel like drawings that you would do yourself i love this where he finds his cockatoos who've been hiding professor dupont went into the conservatory there were all his cockatoos where they always were every single one professor dupont threw wide his arms he said good morning my fine feathered friends some people never learn very witty and sweet and there's a postcard, look, from Chicago in the middle of it. 
from the first time I read this in 1995. My friend Mark. That's nice. That's magic, finding postcards from a long time ago from old friends. Here's another Quentin Bleck, A Tale of Kitty in Boots. Now, this is a, a, a Beatrix Potter story that uh, hadn't been published with the rest. I, I don't know if it was a manuscript or um, it had been published differently to the rest anyway. So Beatrix Potter hadn't hadn't illustrated it. So in recent years, they got Quentin Blake to do his stuff on it, which he does, I think, brilliantly. And this is hilarious. It's a beautifully produced book from Warren, the people who did um, uh, the original Beatrix Potters. Anyway, <laughs> the funniest thing about this book isn't the scratchy drawings, although they're hilarious, and the story itself, which is also great fun and involves wonderful cameos from lots of the Beatrix Potter characters. The funniest thing were the reviews on Amazon and the like from Beatrix Potter fans who turn out to be um, uh, quite protective over the original artwork of Beatrix Potter. And uh, Quentin Blake came in for some criticism for drawing pictures that were quite, quite scratchy and... Um, not as composed and as realistic as Beatrix Potter's. It was very funny reading the stuff about <laughs> that they said about this. Once upon a time, there was a serious, well-behaved young black cat. It belonged to a kind old lady who assured me that no other cat could compare with Kitty. She lived in constant fear that Kitty might be, st be stolen. I hear there is a shocking fashion for black catskin muffs. Wherever is Kitty gone to? Kitty, Kitty. She called it Kitty, but Kitty called herself Miss Catherine St. Quintin. And you can see Kitty's got big ideas about herself. I love that. The cat in a fancy frock, arranging flowers. It's a very odd story. Cheesebox called her Q and Winky Peeps called her Squintums. They were very common cats. The old lady would have been shocked had she known of the acquaintance. And she would have been painfully surprised had she ever seen Miss Kitty in a gentleman's Norfolk jacket and little fur-lined boots. It's a kind of cross-dressing, mischievous story. <coughs> the cat who came to tea. Sorry, the cat, the tiger who came to tea. Lovely Judith Kerr. These books, which I was kind of aware of as a kid, but didn't find until uh, much later. And they're just gorgeous. I love this story and I love the glimpse of the town when they go out for tea at the end because the tiger's eaten everything in the fridge and of course you see the little cat slinking after them. Uh, but it's the shops in the street and it seems to belong to a different time, the toy shop, the ladies clothes shop, the butchers. And this time that we live in where everything's kind of not quite not quite as good. High streets aren't quite as nice. And um, yeah, this reminds me of, you know, her units in the kitchen, the, the, the sink and stove and the cupboards and everything look like things from my childhood, you know, which certainly seems an age ago. It probably is an age ago. 60s and 70s. When was this? 67? 68? Yep, just lovely. I love Judith Carr's books. Kerr, Carr, <coughs> all of her books. The Mog Cat ones and her books uh, about her own childhood. Now, I had to read a whole lot of books about um, Greek mythology. Last year when I was writing Josephine and the Argonauts, the Doctor Who book that I did for Puffin. And so I reread loads of stuff about mythology. The most useful stuff wasn't the heavy... Robert Graves stuff or the dull Stephen Fry. <laughs> I'm sorry for fans of Stephen Fry's rewrites of uh, Greek myths, but I actually fell asleep. He includes everything um, in his kind of fulsome, florid way. The best versions are the ones that, that trim the story the stories down into a, uh, a manageable whole. I think Roger Lancelin Green is, is the best for that. 
published in Puffin, his book about Robin Hood as well. But there were some other picture books that I loved as well. Maybe I just like the books with pictures in. <laughs> and there were um, piss all pictures in, <laughs> in Stephen Fry's books worth, worth looking at. This is amazing. It's the Greek myths as illustrated by Rodney Matthews, who did in the 70s um, lots of LP covers and posters <clears throat> for um, the posters of kind of airbrushed fantasy epic landscapes with giant prehistoric beasts, kind of hairy rhinos and mammoths attacking reindeer with laser guns and ships made out of wood flying into space. Just fantastic stuff. And I had these posters, at least one or two, in my um, student room when I was first a student. And it it came from Guru, the shop in Darlington, which has just closed down after 50 odd years, the hippie goth shop that um, was one of the kind of magical places in uh, near the town that I grew up. It is Minotaur. All of them are kind of rock opera LP covers. And remind me of that time when, you know, fantasy fiction used to have covers like that, that were so over the top and tasteless and tacky, but gave you such a good idea of what the novel was going to be like. And these things in themselves are perfect for the Greek myths. There's Medusa. You know, they're proper monsters in this. Anyway, that's a lovely book from, I think, the 80s. It looks as if it belongs to an earlier time. Other books about myths that I found uh, were the Hamlin books um, that retell chunks of myth, like the Iliad, Odyssey, the Odyssey, and the legends of ancient Greece, <coughs> which um, Hamlin books are always the ones worth looking out for when you're looking for vintage kids' books of the 60s and 70s. They were, for some reason, whoever was editing there, whoever was paying for this stuff, um, whoever they knew, God, that smells... That smells amazing, that, um, that mixture of furniture polish and um, old shelves and <coughs> paper slowly mouldering <laughs> and sunny days. I do think something about the books that people read on sunny days on blankets in the grass or um, those days are trapped inside somehow. Anyway, these are wonderfully atmospheric. The age of the airbrush and and acrylics, I think we should call it. Yeah. Daedalus and Icarus look. And from what I remember, the way these are told. Um, oh, look at Heracles fighting a multi-headed beast during his labours. They're sexy as well because it was all these bare-chested blokes, of course, and that was the great um, for uh, little gay boys. <laughs> One of the great draws of ancient myths and their illustrations, whether they were Viking, Greek or Roman, were uh, all the bare-chested men and the loincloths. That was a big deal. These were Italian in translation in the early 80s, that's what it is. Uh, doesn't say who wrote them. Just says the translation is by Harin Sisti. Yes. Nope. I can't get an author from that. They just arrive out of the ether. I've got a pile of annuals. Ah, these are treasure. Space 1999. I have wonderful nostalgia for. I love the paperback novelizations as well. Another one. The years aren't on these, which isn't very helpful. The annuals were okay, uh, world distributors. So they were produced in the middle of Manchester, along with Doctor Who and all the others, by artists and writers working in Lever Street, in that wonderful um, building opposite 19, um, the coffee bar known as 19, which does lovely breakfasts now, and the bookshop. And you can see this place. Where, with a stationer's, which is now knocked down next door to it, where they produced 50 annuals a year for 
I think about 30 years, 60s through to the 80s, magical. Dad's Army, 1975, also world distributors. I love the fact that those books were produced in our town. Um, and Shiver and Shake Annual. Now, that's an, a Fleetway Annual. And these comic strippy ones were even more familiar than world distributors. Toby's Timepiece. It was a Doctor Who uh, riff. A <clears throat> little kid gets a long scarf and a time machine and goes back to the Middle Ages and has an adventure. That stirred in my memory. Yeah, Fleetway Annuals are, are wonderful. And I love Cheeky and Wizard and Chips and Whoopi and all those things. Now all the pages are going very yellow. You, you see them in shops and they're kind of decaying in front of you. I guess they, it was cheap paper, but these things are almost 50 years old now. Baba and Father Christmas. I read these at school as a kid and um, have found them since. I looked out in a, a shop in Darlington uh, last year, a charity shop, which was all ex-library books. Everything cost 20p, and I bought nearly all of the Bar Bar books in hardback, and I it was so lucky. The one about Santa Claus is, is pretty magical, I think, and worth rereading each year. It's the one where you see the cross-section of where Santa lives, where everything is kept, and where the elves do their work, but everything about Baba is smashing, I think. Now, the last thing, my small collection of magic roundabout stories. This was a show I was obsessed with. Eric Thompson wrote the, um, the British version and took great liberties with the French original. And it's acidic and sarcastic and hilarious. <clears throat> His voice is kind of there in my head um, all the time because I was obsessed with this show. I realised that um, I thought the world was like the magic roundabout <laughs> and all the people in it, that somehow all the personalities in this show, it was a kind of microcosm, much more than, than George Eliot's Middlemarch was, because he seems to cover all personality types <laughs> with the characters in the magic roundabout. It's kind of um, quite profound, I think. The kind of sneering incompetence versus the um, lethargic wit of Dougal um, and the, uh, the busybody um, attitude of that of Brian the Snail, <laughs> and and you know always striving as well to be like Florence and be as sensible and clever as as, as Florence, but. Um, never quite making it. And of course, the blue cat from the movie, which I don't think was ever on the telly here. This is a beautiful book version. Um, oh, God, that smells. That smells amazing. That smells like, yeah, the, the past distilled. Look at those colours. These are the colours of my imagination, really. And when I look at them, I see them kind of in my uh, own paintings all the time. These kind of pinks and blues and oranges of the world of the magic roundabout. Anyway, it's a very strange story um, about evil coming into the, the Garden of Eden of the magic roundabout in the form of a blue cat called Buxton, who takes over on behalf of a kind of celestial evil creature called the Blue, led by Fenella Fielding in, in the film, I am the Blue, she says. I forgot they went to the moon as well. Anyway, it's a lovely retelling, and I've just found inside the pages a drawing of mine. Ah, there. Wow. From, <laughs> I don't know when this is, probably 12 or 13 years ago, of Festa the Cat. I must have sat in the beach house and drawn Fester in felt tips. Yes, that is the beach house because he's on 
the wicker chair, which eventually fell to pieces. It's a long time ago, though. And, and again, finding treasure inside books you've had a long time. That's what it's all about. Now, do I keep it inside the book, or do I take it out and do something else with it? I think I'll make sure it's preserved. Anyway, that's the end of that pile of... Um, picture books. There's still many more to go through on that particular shelf, but I'm over 20 minutes and I must stop. Right, I'm going to post this, uh, I think, on Saturday. I'll be um, doing something else by then, <laughs> but I hope you're all well. Uh, subscribe and like, and do leave me comments, and um, I will see you soon in another episode.